Welcome to Global Spiritual Revolution Radio here with your host and moderator this evening, Bishop Larry Gators. You can call us in right now from anywhere within the United States of America, Canada, throughout the Caribbean islands, including South America and throughout the world at one 945 Again, beloved, that is one 945 9099. You can listen to us live right now on Facebook.com slash day three TV. Again, beloved, that is Facebook.com slash day three TV. You can also listen to us uh, as well on YouTube.com slash global spiritual revolution radio. You can also listen to us on Red Nation Rising Radio out of Dallas, Texas uh, every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, Red Nation Rising Radio Network is the new dominant force and conservative talk radio. We are so honored tonight to have with us here in our studios at Day 3 TV here in Massapequa, New York, for the very first time on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. And I was sharing with our guests before we went on the air tonight that I've read so much so many books of scholarship by great theologians down through the years concerning the sixth chapter of the book of Genesis. But by far, this book, The Genesis 6 Conspiracy, How Secret Societies and the Descendants of Giants Plan to Enslave Mankind, I have never read a book on this level and to all of our Global Revolution partners, many of you are apostles and bishops and uh, heads of seminaries and Bible universities all over the world. You have to, you have to, beyond a shadow of any, any doubt, to get this man, a man of God for this time, the Honorable um, Gary Wayne. Mr. Gary Wayne, a man, is the award-winning author of this <laughs> blockbuster book entitled The Genesis 6 Conspiracy. Um, Mr. Wayne, it is such a great honor for us here uh, at Global Spiritual Revolution Radio in New York to have you tonight with us, sir. Well, my pleasure and my honor to be here tonight. And uh, I'm hoping the discussion that we're going to have is going to interest your audience and hopefully raise maybe a little bit more curiosity to poke a little bit closer at what Scripture says. And I think they're going to find what we talk about quite entertaining tonight. Absolutely. Uh, 516-945-9099. Again, 516-945-9099. And like I said uh, to our Global Revolution partners around the world, you can listen live, watch live right now on Facebook.com slash Day 3 TV. Um, before we get into the uh, the crux, the meat of this powerful, insightful book entitled The Genesis 6 Conspiracy, uh, if you could just tell us a little bit about your background, uh, Mr. Wayne, and how the Lord led you uh, to write a book of this caliber. Sure, and it's a, it's a bit of a journey to, to get here. There's no doubt about that. And I, like a lot of people, um, you know, raised was raised Christian, but as you go through high school, uh, peer pressure and the education system, it sort of de-Christianizes you. And I... Hmm. I started to follow, you know, the evolutionary ideals and ideas and uh, drop religion and Christianity altogether. But, and then one night I had a brother who we were sitting around and chatting and said, you know, you need to, you need to read this book. He said, you're not going to want to read it, but you need, need to read a book. And it was, uh, this was in the late seventies uh, when we we're having this conversation and he, and he gave me the name of the book, and it was a book called The Late Great Planet Earth by Hal Lindsey. And I'm mm. sure many of your audience will recognize that name. So I read the book, and it literally scared me straight. <laughs> but what I wanted to do was verify what he was saying was actually true in the Bible, and could I start linking that up through other sources and that. And that started me on the path back to God. And on that path back to God, I wanted to take the same sort of contrarian approach, not accept what somebody says or what the standard doctrine or theology on things are, but what does the Bible actually say? Right. And through all of this, I'm, I'm a natural history buff, I'm a natural uh, mythology buff, um, and love all sorts of science fiction and, and things like that, 
Um, but I became a prophecy buff, and that became mm. my true passion. And then as I documented all the different prophecy narratives into different files and things, handwritten notes into files so that I could follow and link all of the various verses up of prophecy, I thought, well, maybe I can start connecting some of these stories. And, and so I decided I'd try my first uh, book out on something I thought that was going to be easy and short. And I just, what I wanted to do is I wanted to connect Genesis 6 to end time prophecy, mm. because as I was doing this work before, uh, beforehand, um, you know, you get the strange story in Genesis 6 and you go, okay, okay, I'm just going to ignore that. And then all of a sudden they start cropping up after the flood with types of people that uh, don't belong to the table of nations. And then mm. I wanted to link that into uh, what that had a how that connected to what Jesus was saying about his second coming in the end time, and the sign of that would be like the days of Noah, and the demons that are crawling out of mouths and people in Revelation and bringing the kings to war, the fallen angels that come down from heaven in Revelation 12 that are uh, thrown down to the earth, and these creatures that come out of the abyss. And I wanted to see whether I could connect that. And then somewhere along the way, as I started to expand outside the Bible, it turned in probably the longest book I'm going to write. At least I hope it's going to be the longest book, because it's an 800-page book, and I took 30% wow. out just to, so I could publish it. Mm -hmm. And so that's sort of how I got there to, to write the book. And then along the way, I started to mix in my research on other religions and mythologies to see what they had to say about prehistory or, or the end time. And that led me into this dark world of the secret societies and mm -hmm. reading all of these different mm -hmm. scriptures and things. And all of a sudden it just changed the whole sort of notion, not just to chronologue Genesis 6 and connect it with the end time, but to tell uh, a story uh, and mm. to tell a story that turned into more of a conspiracy story. So mm. it's really a transgenerational 6,000 year connect the dots investigation to the rise of the Nephilim and the secret societies and mysticism and the descendants of Cain and the fallen angels to the royal kingships that they begat and how they affected the antediluvian world, the early post diluvian epoch. Um, how they affected uh, the Exodus, why it's important to understand this in the context of the, the Exodus, how they impacted our history, what they're doing today, and what they're planning to do to bring about the end time. So all of a sudden it became this significant project, and, uh, you know, a lot of times I just thought, you know, I, I'm, uh, there's no way I'm going to finish this, and there's no way I want to finish it, and probably a lot of people are going to think I've, uh, I'm off my rocker with some <laughs> of this the information that I turned over and put into the book. So that is awesome. That is awesome. Uh, my first question, uh, as we delve into um, this historical insightful book, um, the Genesis six conspiracy, why is it so important for leaders within the body of Christ to know um, in the 21st century now, what happened uh, within that specific time period going back thousands of years to Genesis chapter 6, because a lot of theologians and, and pastors and biblical scholars and rabbinical scholars that I've interviewed down through the years here on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio have said to me, uh, Bishop, that has nothing to do with salvation, but why is it so critical, uh, Gary, for the body of Christ to know uh, the history uh, of Genesis yeah. chapter 6 and how it impacts the church world today? So the first thing we need to understand is, and this is a pretty well-known doctrine that comes out of the Bible, is nothing is new under the sun. Mm. So you have this repeating of things, and, and in that repetition you can understand things as to perhaps how they might uh, come about in the future in, into the end time. So that's kind of the first thing. The second thing is there's a lot of the imagery of the end time sort of comes out of prehistory, whether or not it's the, the it's the kings or it's the uh, um, <clears throat> Babel religion uh, or dragons as, 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 and serpents as what um, Satan is called. So it's, I think it's important to go back and understand that imagery so we can better understand the end time. But here's the real 
clincher for me is as we're clearly told for the end time that uh, even the uh, the elect will be deceived if that were possible, mm. and seemingly it will be because it says that even the elect will be deceived. And so the deceptions that are going to be coming are so large, so vast, we may not be able to follow a lot of our leadership because they're going to be part of that falling away, a part of that apostasy, a mm. part of that deception, or just deceived by the deception to follow along. And the only thing that we're going to have is our faith, which is number one, but also our understanding of what is in Scripture so that even when people that we trust are telling us something that's wrong or non-scriptural, we're not going to follow them. We're going to follow the Word of God. Mm, that is so powerful. 516-945-9099. Again, beloved, 516-945-9099. We have uh, author Gary Wayne, all the way from Vancouver, British Columbia. He is the author of the Genesis 6 Conspiracy, which has, I believe, 97 chapters. Am I correct in saying that, sir? 98, actually. Wow. <laughs> and uh, uh, a preface and an epilogue, so let's just make it a, a nice round hundred. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and my next question, uh, Gary, what connection does the giants in Genesis chapter 6 have with secret societies and Illuminati bloodlines today. Um, connect the dots for us. Well, that's a, that's a big uh, topic to connect, but what mm. I will do, and, and jump in any time if you've got some questions on this, because this could go a thousand different ways yes. and all good, interesting ways in the conversation. So, mm. as I mentioned as I started to do the research, I started to read and learn about what secret societies believed and what their beginnings are. Mm -hmm. And so many of your audience, uh, many of the audience might be surprised to know that Freemasonry will take the beginning of their organization back to this exact same period of time before the flood mm -hmm. and then revived again after the flood. So let me sort of back this right up and, and tell the audience how that sort of comes about. So what their belief is, is that uh, Adam was taught something called the seven sacred sciences yes. in Eden. And this is the knowledge God is giving Adam. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's things like grammar and rhetoric and dialectics and arithmetic and geometry and music and astronomy and all the things he's going to need to... Um, um, be a successful being in Eden and, and on the earth. But, of course, along the way, there's the fall of Adam. Mm. And according to Free Freemasonic records is that he, Adam then passes this knowledge on to two individuals, actually three, but Abel's not around for very long. Mm. So he passes it on to Cain and then later Seth, after Seth is born. Um, and so we have this knowledge going down two different lines, uh, one with Seth and one with Cain. And, of mm -hmm. course, Seth keeps this knowledge wholly free of rituals uh, and always honoring the, the God of the universe, giving him credit for everything and not having kings and being humble, just as you, uh, what you would expect. But Cain doesn't repent. Mm -hmm. Cain continues in his rebellious ways, and he's going to develop this knowledge first in a way that is different than Seth and is not going to be designed to do what Seth is doing. He is going to, and along with his firstborn son named Enoch, and just so the audience understands, there's two Enochs, uh, and it's very important to understand this because they both had a big impact and they both wrote scriptures. So you have Enoch, first son of Cain, and you have Enoch, son of Jared. One's evil, one is not. Obviously, the son of Jared is the Holy One that's raptured to heaven, Enoch, son of Cain. He writes some scriptures and does some things that make him the greatest patriarch of the ancient Masonic order. Mm -hmm. And what he does is he starts to write down uh, the, the sciences and religions and keep records of it. And he vents his writing to do this, and then he starts to pervert the sciences even more. Mm -hmm. And he creates a mystical religion, a mystical sun-worshipping religion as part of the rebellion and part of changing these sciences, not to give God credit for anything going forward, 
not to honor him, not to respect him, and to diminish the God of the Bible, and to honor the, the new pantheon of the fallen rebellious angels that he's taking on to worship through this religion and to uh, lead people away from God. Mm. And as they do that, they also create the secret societies to develop the specifics of these sciences. And people will understand that as it comes down through the ages as being passed on through the knowledge of the mystery schools, right? But that's a little bit further down. But this is when the ancient Masonic organization is created. And as this line of Cain develops, um, there's uh, Lamech, again, there's two Lamechs in the two genealogies, and his progeny, uh, mainly Nama, Jubal, and Jubal, and Tubal Cain, mm. are again significant patriarchs of Freemasonry, reflecting this organization's history before the flood. And then they partner with the Nephilim in Genesis 6, the descendants of Cain, uh, and the mystical religions and these secret societies and the technology that they're developing with the Nephilim of Genesis 6 to totally corrupt the antediluvian age. And they build great monuments in the antediluvian age to wor worship this pantheon of gods. And people might be surprised to learn that when I say the fifth science, is geometry, what they call it in the craft. And when I talk about the craft, that's mm. what Freemasonry calls himself. So if you hear which craft, mm. understand it's the same type of organization, right? Mm. So within the craft, um, they do not do not call it geometry as the fifth science. They actually call it masonry. And mm. then they credit uh, Enoch for developing 36,525 books worth of this knowledge that are stored in nine vaults of knowledge stacked on one on top of each other below the pyramid, whom they also give credit for for building the pyramids with this knowledge. And the thing to understand with this knowledge that's going on in the antediluvian epoch is that this isn't just a bunch of goat herders or agrarians, you know, eking out um, a living. They developed this technology to a level that I think was greater than what we have today. So it's not the mundane nature of these sciences, it's what they did with it. Mm. And that's how, through the Nephilim and through the sciences, they corrupt the entire earth, right? Not just the violence on the earth. And so when we talk about, I'm kind of getting off, off straight, we can come back to that later if you want. So this is when that partnership is born. Mm. And so what the Nephilim do with this partnership is, is they usurp the kingships of the various civilizations, and they start royal dynasties. Again, totally mm -hmm. opposite with what the Sethians are doing. You don't hear of any kings mm -hmm. in the Sethian line. You don't hear of any kings after the flood in Israel until they demand a king with Saul and then David and then on. Um, so this is totally a completely different path that this group of people are on and from the, uh, from the Cain line. And so this kingship then imposes this mystical religion on everybody in the world. Mm. And, right? And, that, and, they're, and they're doing mm. a complete rebellion. And they're in mm. partnership with the fallen angels who are giving them additional illicit information that's developing these sciences at an extraordinarily rapid pace. And all of this goes to bring about the flood, because not only are are people violent and that they've rebelled against God, just as in time will have a rebellion, uh, as noted in Daniel and in, in Thessalonians. But there's a rebellion in the antediluvian epoch uh, against God by the giants, uh, just as there's a rebellion at Babel after the flood, which, uh, again, is related, but um, I'm jumping ahead of myself. Mm -hmm. So this is the start of the organizations and the partnership and the organizations that continue after the flood and are still in partnership to this day. Hmm. I, I, I don't want to get ahead of the uh, specific chapters and sections of your book. I, I want to come back to these royal bloodlines. Um, we can touch on it now or we can do it later on in the broadcast um, about is there a genetic marker um, that connects uh, the bloodline of the fallen angels to the black nobility of today? 
um, to the Rothschilds, the Warburgs, you know. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I don't want to get too far ahead of you, but th- these bloodlines, uh, have they entered married down through the centuries? I know the House of Rothschilds, the House of Stuart in Scotland um, have entered, mingled their blood to keep it, um, to keep it according to their mindset, pure. So the the royal families today, the House of Windsor, the House of Stuart, um, are these families, uh, the black nobility that we call them, uh, are they interconnected to the bloodline of the Nephilims going back to Genesis chapter 6? Not just the House of Stuart, but the um, French dynasty entitled the St. Clairs. And if our mm-hmm. revolution partners get a get, if you get an opportunity, connect the, the name Larry Sinclair to Barack Obama. That's another subject for another day. Uh, is there a connection here? Not to get too far uh, ahead of you, Mister uh, Wayne, but is there a yeah. connection between these dynasties going back to the blood of the fallen angels? Yeah. Well, they certainly believe so, and uh, they have names and things for it, and they keep the genealogies that go back to the Nephilim and the fallen angels. Wow. And from the royal family perspective, as opposed to the sort of the, the nobles or the family that's a little bit more further distance uh, from the, the direct lineage of the kingships, um, they believe they get their divine right to rule from the fallen angels and uh, the Nephilim, who they say they can trace their genealogies back to. And they do have names for these various uh, things that they say that they have within their blood. But the big thing is, is that, yes, they, they do trace their uh, bloodlines all the way back. And you might hear that in the secret society mm. uh, term as in real, as in a potency that's in the blood, right? Yes. And something that could uh, engineer the rebirth within that blood of the Nephilim uh, of the ancient times actually believe that. And if some people are into history, they'll know Vril was the same ideology the Nazis had. And again, this is all connected, but I'm jumping a little ahead of myself. (laughs) They also talk about something called the gene of Isis Mm. that they believe is also a DNA marker. But again, Mm. yes, so they do, and uh, they, they all have this, connection back into prehistory. And the best example to show you what's going on with these royal house families is go back to World War I. So in World War I, you have this war breakout in Europe for the most part. And you've got um, the Romanovs in Russia, and you've got the Habsburgs in Austria, and you've got the Kaiser Wilhelm family that's in Germany, and you've got the Windsors that are in England, and you've got the Orange Dynasty that's in uh, Holland, and more dynasties included, and they were all intermarried. They were actually all cousins. And so Mm. this was really a family war, Mm. right? Mm. And so they intermarry to keep those bloodlines as pure as possible. They have to bring in diluted bloodlines to try and prevent some of the genetic defects that, you know, affected the Habsburg dynasty uh, or some of the people in the Spanish dynasty uh, that, that are a little bit more famous. But... That's the best example in a modern era that's not that far away to represent how powerful and long-lasting these bloodlines have been. Wow. This this is powerful. You are opening my eyes, um, Gary. Uh, we have with us uh, to our global revolution partners all over the world, and we have a man of God whom God has anointed and ordained for such a time as this, um, the Honorable Gary Wayne, he is the author of the Genesis 6 Conspiracy. And uh, near the end, before we get to our first break, and near the end of the broadcast tonight, Mr. Wayne is going to give you information how to uh, obtain this powerful book. Call him right now, 516-945-9099. Again, beloved, that's 516 516- Nine four five nine zero nine nine. If you have a question for uh, Mr. Wayne, you can email us right now uh, at Global Spiritual Revolution Radio at Yahoo.com. Again, beloved, that's Global Spiritual Revolution Radio at Yahoo.com. You can listen to us live right now on Facebook.com slash Day 3 TV. Again, it's Facebook.com slash Day 3 TV. Again, um, the Genesis 6 Conspiracy. 
Uh, my next question, uh, Mr. Wayne, what is the Genesis 6 conspiracy? As you capsulize this, and we're kind of laying the foundation as we go forth here, uh, dissecting this powerful book, The Genesis 6 Con- Conspiracy. What is the Genesis 6 conspiracy, and what is the end game of the global elite uh, here in the 21st century? So the conspiracy is, uh, goes back to preventing what God did in Genesis 2 in Eden with the creation of Adam and then Eve, and where he provides the breath of life to Adam and then Eve to be the ones who are going to raise humankind mm. through their offspring in the future time above angels. Mm. So the rebellion happens before this in, in, in my research, and This is a revenge and a consequence of the rebellion of the fallen angels. And so what they're trying to do, uh, A, with the first revenge in Eden, is prevent this from happening, Mm. right? The second revenge comes in Genesis 6 to inject a hybrid being into the earth that is superior in and... um, I guess support from the from the who I call the celestial mafia, the mm. uh, the fallen <laughs> angels, right. um, to make sure that they're going to enslave humankind, and they've been trying to do that wow. ever since to cut off this thing, and that's why you have the flood, which is the second aspect of what the whole flood event is about. Not only to wash the world clean of this corruption and give humankind a second chance, but a second chance to fulfill the commission that they're in. And so everything happens over and over and over, and we see this happening all the time. And at the end and at the end of the game, what their end game is, is they want to bring upon the end time. Mm. That's what most people don't understand, is, is that the forces opposing Christianity and God want to bring upon the end time. They want this rendezvous with destiny. They want to deceive, and it's the fallen angels and the demons who are deceiving humankind um, to slander God and do the things that they're afraid to do and to rebel against uh, God as they did, hopefully to get another realm um, where they can live on their own and away from God. Unfortunately, though, with what happened with the resurrection, that plan came to an end. So the angels and the demons know that they can't win. There's there's nothing that they really can argue, I think, no matter what they do, to suggest to God that he should give them grace and forgive them and give them another realm to live separately. Um, that's been sealed. But they deceive the humans to continue to rebel like they did. So that part's just destruction. And they're trying to prevent any humans from being raised... Uh, in the future time, except that we already have the resurrection event, which nullified the whole rebellion. So everything after the rebellion is just to do more damage. But as far as the secret societies and the royal bloodlines, they don't know this. Mm. And they think they can actually fight for their refi- fight for their freedom through a rebellion. It's kind of like that allegory in Star Wars that you have, where you have the rebellion Mm -hmm. Uh, who are the good guys, and they have this mystical religion, and they have this dualist religion between the dark force and the the Mm -hmm. good force. That's dualism Mm -hmm. uh, in polytheism, just as, you know, they have a... uh, you know, mother goddess and, and a, a father god in polytheism, another dualist aspect. But the big thing is good versus evil. And the Dark Empire is the god of the Bible in their allegory. Mm. And, right? So they're fighting mm-hmm. against this empire um, for their freedom. That's so what they're trying to sell to humans through the mystical religions, that they are the children of light. The god of the Bible and Christians are all evil. And, you, but... Because there's a dualistic dominion to the universe in their religion, that they're always in balance, no one can win, but you can fight for your freedom as they have and these other beings that they're going to show us in the end time. We have Gary Wayne with us. He is the author of what I call the most powerful and prolific book when it comes to uh, Genesis chapter 6, Scholarship in Theology. The Genesis 6 Conspiracy, 
how secret societies in the descendants of giants plan to enslave mankind. You can call us in right now at one five one six nine four five nine zero nine nine. Again, one five one six nine four five nine zero nine nine. If you have a question for Mr. Wayne, you can email us right now. Uh, at globalspiritualrevolutionradio.com. Again, beloved, globalspiritualrevolutionradio uh, uh, at yahoo.com. Now, you can also check out uh, Gary's website uh, by going logging into uh, genesis6conspiracy.com. Again, genesis6conspiracy.com. Um, let's get into um, Plato's account of Atlantis, and there's a lot of um, theologians and scholars, uh, specifically rabbinical scholars, that say that the term Atlantis is transliterated today into the word Atlanta. We're talking about Atlanta, Georgia, that according to Greek mythology and also Iranian mythology, uh, that Atlantis uh, was half male, half female. Uh, And we know that Atlanta, Georgia, has one of the highest rates of homosexuality and lesbianism. So um, let's break down this, what we call Atlantis, because it's very interesting that in the Latin Vulgate lexicon, uh, Gary, the term uh, Atlantis simply means amniotic. I find that to be interesting, amniotic, uh, uh, which means to... Uh, to inject. And so uh, let's break down Plato's account of Atlantis, uh, Poseidon, you know, and, and what, what it has in connection to Genesis uh, chapter six. What does Greek mythology, uh, Iranian mythology, Babylonian mythology, I believe there's over like 30,000 <laughs> different mythologies throughout the world. What does these mythologies have to do uh, with Genesis chapter six? Yeah, I think the audience, uh, you know, they'll be familiar with Titans a little bit. They might have heard of Anunnaki. Mm. You know, they've probably right. not heard of the Danua or the Detia or the Azura or Zelda or Myas Hosi. Um, these are all different names for, for giants. Mm. And Pete, your audience might be surprised to know that the flood story and the story of the giants is in all cultures and all religions on all continents up in Antarctica, but who knows, they may find something underneath <laughs> someday and find records there yes. as well, um, about the same story that's being told in um, Genesis. But from a polytheist perspective, which is a polytheism of the mystical religions that we were talking about earlier, um, just as in Atlantis um, and with Enoch, Enoch is accredited with uh, not only inventing the religions, but in also creating astrology, which is also a significant part of Atlantis, and it's also the same religion of Atlantis. Mm -hmm. And the Atlantean story, uh, written uh, down in Plato in uh, in both Proteus and Timaeus, Mm -hmm. is probably the most detailed accounts, although one of them is not complete, but um, they're really the the ones that people go to to understand uh, Atlantis. And there are other uh, references to Atlantis and other myths as well. But it's such a direct parallel, but from a polytheist perspective, mm. uh, it's it's a, it's an amazing account, and uh, they get it. He gets the story passed down from Solon, who goes to Sais in Egypt and gets reads it right off the columns in Egypt and brings the the story back. Mm. And uh, so, as the story goes, you have this god who we would know as a fallen angel in mm. in the pantheon, and his name is Poseidon. He's the brother mm. of Zeus and one of the seven. Uh, great um, gods of the uh, Greek uh, antediluvian world, mm. just as seven is a constant around the world, whether it's the seven Asgard gods or, you know, the seven gods and mountains out of uh, China. It's it's a constant. So uh, understand that this uh, re- uh, relates to the seven fallen angels of the leaders of the Watchers that, even though it's not scriptural and it's got some issues, the first book of Enoch will talk about the seven watchers, the main ones, you know, and Azazel will be the most popular one that people might have heard of, uh, or Azazel, as some it's also pronounced. So anyways, what Poseidon does is he marries a human female. Mm. 
And from this marriage, and he has uh, co- he copulates with them and has uh, five sets of twins. Mm. Right, so ten, and these become giants. And most people look at Atlantis as a one island continent, mm-hmm. but it's actually that as being the center. And Atlas rules from as one of those uh, ten children. A Nephilim children, Titan children hmm. in Atlantis, but there's nine other ones. And this is a huge empire of the antediluvian civilization as recorded by the Greeks. And that number 10 is very, very important as we understand mm-hmm. prehistory because what they're trying to do is build the new Atlantis, mm. the new age with 10 kingdoms, 10 empires, right? Mm-hmm. That's what they're mm-hmm. trying to do uh, in the end time, just as Revelation and Daniel talks about. And the Club of Rome, that's their job to do that, is is to organize those ten blocks of nations. And so they're actually uh, uh, the highest developing civilization in the antediluvian epoch, uh, again, developing their technology to, in some mythologies and mythos, to flying saucers and uh, having anti-gravity to move these megalith blocks with and... So they're out to conquer the whole world, but they actually get checked by the Athenians. And what's mm. going on between A and B there is, is as the Atlantis mythology goes, they start off as judicious rulers, good mm. rulers, but somehow the human form is corrupting them as they go, as the mythology goes, and they turn to black magic, they turn to violence, to wars, they, they, they start, after they lose their immortality, which isn't really accounted for, in the Greek mythology, although it is in Genesis 6, with life being limited to 120 years, mm. they start to eat humans and they start to drink blood to live longer. Mm. Right? Mm. And this becomes a significant sin of the antediluvian epoch. So they turn the whole world through these Nephilim-dominated empires into a state of violence and corruption to the point where the gods gather to bring on the flood and started anew. Mm-hmm. And what's interesting, though, in the uh, Greek mythology, not Atlantean, but the survivors for from the flood in what most people say is just the biblical Noah story is the Deucalia and Epira. Well, Pyrrha, as you take that back to Norea and then follow the etymology back, that goes back to Nama. So whether it's a descendant of Nama or actually Nama as daughter of Lamech of the mm-hmm. Cain line, uh, it's very interesting because she's known for cavorting and copulating with fallen angels. But the important figure here to keep in mind is Deucalion, who is the son of Prometheus. Hmm. And Prometheus is either the son of another uh, god named Prometheus, so he's either a titan or a titan god. Either way, he's Nephilim. So this is a Nephilim survival story, as polytheism records, not a human story. Hmm. This is so interesting. Um, You are opening my eyes, Mr. Wayne. We have with us Gary Wayne. Uh, He is the author of The Genesis 6 Conspiracy here on Global Revolution Radio out of Massapequa, uh, New York. We are broadcasting out of our new studios here at Day 3 TV. And you can call us in right now at 516-945-9099. Again, beloved, 516-945-9099. Now, if you're calling outside of the continental United States of America, you can call us in right now at 1, then 516-945-9099. Um, is there, was there a conspiracy with the early church fathers, um, was specifically Constantine? Um, I believe he ruled the Roman Empire between 274 to 337 AD. Was he responsible, um, A, for removing certain books of the word of the Lord, like the books of Enoch and the book of the Apocrypha. Um, Was he responsible for this? A and B, why were these so-called lost books, the books of Eden, the books of Adam, why were these specific documents, uh, Gary, such a threat to the early church? That's that's a very, very good point, and we don't know whether or not all of the surviving books were the originals or not, but uh, they certainly did assemble, I believe, at the Council of Nicaea what books were going to go into the canon, and uh, they did 
separate ones that they thought that were apocryphal or uh, doubted authority or couldn't confirm it uh, as being actual scripture. So there was a sifting that was, was going on at that time. But that didn't mean that the church fathers didn't read the Bible literally, because mm. they did. Mm-hmm. Right? That was something that changed sometime after the rise of the Royal Society, uh, and uh, this interpretive uh, understanding of the Bible that sort of creeped in. The church fathers, just as the disciples and just as Jesus was, they're literalists, mm. right? They read the Bible literally. Yes. I mean, you you wouldn't say that Jesus said that this sign to the wicked generation will be the <laughs> sign of Noah. Yes. Or not the sign of Noah, I mean the sign of Jonah. Uh, and take that as an allegory, right? That mm. uh, basically, because a lot of people will say that Jonah's story can't be true because you can't live in a whale, right? Right. And go uh, <laughs> be under the seas and in the abyss of the seas for three days and three nights. Right. And so Jesus is basically saying the sign is that sign, and I will be in the grave for three days and three nights, and then I'm going to rise. That's the sign to the wicked generation. Mm-hmm. But if you do things in an allegorical nature, then basically people will turn something like that inside out. They will say, well, Jesus was referring to an allegory, so the resurrection's an allegory, mm. right? That's something that, that's a modern uh, mm-hmm. corruption, in my opinion, that yeah. has come into understanding the Bible. And so they were literalists, and that's why you have the schism of the Gnostic Essenes mm. and other people at the time of the Church, because they're upset that the literalist Catholics are in control of the uh, the Roman Church. Mm. So yes, there's a bunch of things going on um, that they're weeding the books down, but they're also eliminating books that aren't saying that Jesus is the Son of God or anything to do with the deity status whatsoever. Because in the Gnostic version of Jesus, he's just a mortal prophet, and he died on the cross. He did not die on the cross. He actually survived the cross, or the cross is just an allegorical story. And they were fighting for primacy Mm-hmm. at the time of, of Jesus and, and later. And so that's part of the weeding down. I would also say that in the King James Bible that was put out in 1610 and then republished again mm-hmm. in 1611, there was the apocry- apocrypha books that were taken out by the 1880s out of the Bible that most of the Protestants would know it as today. Um, the Catholic Bible still has those books in it, but again, so there's been another weeding down of some of those books, which some of them, you know, they, they, there's a couple issues in some of them, I'll, I'll grant you that, but some also some good contextual reading in the Apocrypha of those books that were originally in the original King James. Mm. So, but I, I do I do sort of uh, go to the idea, but this has been sort of a long-term sort of move, away, move it away from literal to mm-hmm. allegorical and suppress the knowledge of what happened in prehistory. Mm. We have Gary Wayne with us. He is the uh, author of the Genesis 6 Conspiracy, How Secret Societies and the Descendants of Giants Plan to Enslave Humankind, 516 945 Nine zero nine nine, beloved. Again, that is five one six nine four five nine zero nine nine. You can li- listen to us live and watch us live right now, anywhere throughout the world on Facebook dot com slash day three TV. Again, beloved, that is Facebook dot com slash day three TV. Um, what is the etymology, Gary, of the words demagogues? Uh, connected to the word heroes. We often yeah. use these words, and, and the Bible says my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. And I personally believe so many people have are so spiritually ignorant that they don't even realize they're self-cursing themselves. So what is the etymology or the origination of the words demagogue in connection to the word heroes as we're talking about the Genesis 6 conspiracy? Right. And... Uh I'm going to come back to that just in a second. I, I just kind of realized with some of the things I've been referring to in that, I want the audience to understand that even though I use other sources for context, mm-hmm. I always weigh everything back to what it says in the Bible. Yes. Right? Yep. So that, uh, okay. and, and as long as you do that, I think you're safe. And even with apocryphal books like the first book of Enoch, which has some terrific stuff in there about Genesis 6 and giants and things like that, but... It's apocryphal, and so it has some issues in it. Mm. Um, and uh, so, again, I like that book a lot compared mm-hmm. to a lot of other ones that I've read. 
but you can't totally 100% rely on it. So you still have to go back to scripture as your measurement stick. So just so that the audience mm-hmm. understands that. Yes. Now, heroes. And we understand heroes today in a completely different understanding is what they understood it in the ancient epoch. So mm. everybody's heard of Superman, and I'll come mm-hmm. back to Superman with some imagery there for people in a second. Or Batman, or mm-hmm. these uh, Captain America, or all, all these beings that are either have superpowers or have some sort of bionic parts or stuff that are on it. Mm. These are reflections of an ancient time, in my opinion. Mm. And it's there to continue to prepare Mm. us and brainwash us for the information that they're going to deliver in the end time to deceive us. Mm. And so if you take hero back to the ancient time, it's not understood as somebody who rescues somebody today and everybody likes it because he's a a good ethical person and he Mm. does good things and it's a human that does that. Hero understood and defined in the ancient epoch is the offspring of a god and a human to produce a demigod. Mm. That's why Hmm. you see them called heroes in Greek mythology, Mm -hmm. and in some translations of the Bible, not the King James Bible, you'll hear uh, the Nephilim in Genesis called the heroes of old and the men of renown, right? Right. And that's a direct tie-in back to these offspring of fallen angels, in this case, or the offspring of the gods, right? And here, they're also called heroes in Mesopotamia and uh, ancient Sumeria with the Anunnaki. Hmm. They're also called heroes. And these are the same as the Nephilim, Hmm. uh, produced in exactly the same way. And we gave the example of Poseidon marrying Clymene, right? Hmm. I mean, it is the same story, just from a polytheist perspective. Right. So when we see superheroes today, we need to understand they're brainwashing us. Now, let's take Mm -hmm. Superman. Mm -hmm. So he has this, uh, you know, he comes from another planet, which is, uh, uh, you can take that as an alien mythos. um, And in the ancient alien mythos, they kind of combine everything. Mm -hmm. But he's got a triangle on his uh, chest, and it's an upside Mm -hmm. down pyramid. Mm. Right. Okay. Mm. And then it's got this yellow in the background and that sunlight and the pyramids were glowing with light. They had Mm. the shiny surface on them. They glowed in the sun. And light Mm. is also an allegory for knowledge, which is what Mm. Satan was promising from the the, uh, tree of good and evil in the fall in Eden to become like God. They believe one of the key components to become gods in the physical world is knowledge. So Gnosticism and polytheism is a, no, is a knowledge cult of trying to become a god in the physical world as to what God is promising us, which is not the physical world. Mm. Now, uh, to complete the, uh, the allegory of Superman, uh, this is uh, somebody just by the name Superman, somebody who is greater than uh, humans, right? And he can fly and he can do super things. But that S that's in there is always a, like a stylized snake or a serpent. Hmm. So have a good look at that S and bring up some logos on the, on the Internet. Mm-hmm. You'll see what I'm talking about. And he comes from another planet called Krypton from the house of L, E-L. Hmm. So he's L is the word for God or an angel, right? Mm-hmm. So he's the son of his father, El, as mm. in Nephilim. Hmm. Well, this, this is and, heavy. Go ahead. And you, you could also mm. extend that further as being the son of El in a polytheist sort of understanding. Mm-hmm. He is a Magianic type figure as the son of God. Hmm. And, and so uh, this term, with the etymology of the word heroes, in connection to the word demagogue, a, a scripture came to my mind in the word of the Lord in Revelation 3 and 9 when, when Jesus said, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. So when, when you talk about the word demagogue or demagogue in connection mm-hmm. to the word hero, um, these are, in fact, the men of renown in Genesis 6 and 4 that mingled their seed with the daughters of men 
and produce a race of giants. Am I correct in saying that, Gary? Yes, and the idea of a demon related to demigod, I mean, that's all connected in its, mm-hmm. in its etymology. Wow. This is... And this is one of the, uh, the words that come out of ancient Greek mythology in terms of being related to these demigods is the word hubris. Hmm. that they overreach with their arrogance and their pride. Mm. Mm. And that will also be (laughs) the characteristic of Antichrist. And, you know, that's interesting because even the word NASA, (laughs) interesting, uh, is in both Greek mythology uh, and Jewish mythology as a fallen species or a fallen uh, angel um, denoting uh, Lucifer or star that has fallen. I, I know NASA a few years ago, I don't know if they still had this program, but they had a program uh, a few years ago entitled the Lucifer Project. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, and to our Global Revolution partners, you can check out the website uh, on the Glenn Research Center.com, the Glenn Research Center.com, where it will give detailed information concerning the Lucifer or the Luciferian project, where it seems like the United States, actually the global elite want to create, like you're saying, that 10 zone, um, which, which the Bible talks about that 10 horn kingdom. Um, Are are we seeing this now as Mm -hmm. the world is preparing for the antichrist? Yeah, we are. I mean, and it's uh, not happening at the speed that, these secret societies and royal bloodlines and organizations would like to see it happen at, but they've already divided the world up into the 10 spheres of influence or Mm. trading blocks that they want. Mm. Um, And there's things that are happening all the time, like the Brexit thing. And perhaps with Trump being elected, it might slow things down. Understand though, they're trying to push this forward more quickly, but also understand that until the restrainer is removed, we're not going to have the end time. So they can try as much as they want, but until the ordained time, it's not going to happen. So they'll accept the ordained time. They have to, but they would prefer to do it on their own timetable, and that would be sooner than later. Gary, we are going into our uh, break here. And uh, and to those uh, out there um, in our global revolution land, we have Gary Wayne, um, the author of the blockbuster book, The Genesis 6 Conspiracy. Again, the Genesis 6 Conspiracy. This is indeed a a must-buy for any theologian, any pastor, or any Christian who wants to um, have themselves to go into a greater knowledge of the Word of the Lord. We, We will be back in a few seconds here with Gary Wayne on Global Spiritual Revolution Radio. 